Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with me, your host Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 447. That's 447 of the Agostino Zinga show. Hope you're good wherever you may be. Thanks for checking out the show. As per usual, if it's your first time, your first time, as you can see, first time check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave a comment down below. And if you're listening to the show via the podcast app, then of course a five star review and a share will help it go a long, long way. So make sure you do that. Get involved on there today, and of course support for your patron is always more than welcome at patreoncom agostino You get one bonus show that's coming live and direct at you tomorrow. So make sure you jump on there, patreoncom show to get a chance to listen to the patron only bonus show available to my backers get involved don't delay get involved on there today um how you doing hope you're good wherever you may be i am feeling okay getting to where i need to be the allergies are still kicking my ass as per usual you know say love you and all that malarkey but you know we're still standing we are still standing um what else has been going on still working my way through Battlestar galactica watched a couple episodes yesterday which was you know fairly decent again as i mentioned previously i'm still not very i'm still not sold on this whole idea about the cylons being shape-shifting yeah shape-shifting human cyborg thingy majiggies and everyone that's got a dick basically falling in love with them that's not really my vibe but overall in terms of a space opera i'm loving it i'm loving every little bit of it so that's been pretty decent to um you know get involved in and all that malarkey but apart from that nothing else what was going on today may not are playing tomorrow against granada in europa league that's about it really to kind of look forward to we have this impending vaccine passport thing happening soon in the uk which i mentioned on the show a while back ago isn't it right i said it was going to be inevitable especially for live events i i was very much uh, how do you say i was pretty much certain at the time when i heard that get it floated that they were definitely going to make it a thing regardless of if the vaccine was successful or not and now even in the post-vaccine world or in a, in a current vaccine world we're still kind of facing the prospects of having to um submit our or make our public health or, no, or make our private health information public in order to gain access to things that we didn't need to make it available for right so to go to the pub go to cinema go to festivals and concerts and now we're going to require you to have some sort of document that proves you've been inoculized um, from this kind of bullshit virus so it's a whole complete shit show but again like i mentioned prior i did really think from the onset that it was something that was bound to happen you know as soon as that idea got floated it was very much unlikely that they were going to turn back and say oh no we're not going to do this anymore it was definitely going to happen it was just a matter of when if not if um so that is something we're sort of having to battle with here in the uk but you know um i think i would say you know i don't know it's difficult if we had a decent opposition to boris who has actually stood for something then it might have actually helped in terms of being able to kind of write another narrative or push back from this sort of thing that we're on at the moment but seeing as Keir Starmer was a little bit passive and i don't know what kind of back deal he's or backdoor deal he has with the tories but he just doesn't strike me as somebody that's going to you know for lack of a better term strike while the iron's hot take advantage of the indecision and the sentiment in the uk and basically side with things that would i wouldn't say place him on the right side of history but side with the current sentiment in the country and basically guarantee himself votes when you know we go to the general election in a few years but he's probably not going to do that he's not going to you know begrudgingly back the bill we're going to end up having to give our medical details over to some random person working at the door at weatherspoons and it's just going to be a complete shit show and then it's not going to end from there right because as soon as we have that we've effectively got our own version of a biometric id card in some respects right we've got probably more information on there than some of our european counterparts have on their id cards right because it's a standard thing they have in, in the european union id cards basically you know giving your date of birth um I'm, I'm not i'm not too sure if it's got blood type on there i'm pretty sure it hasn't but essentially it's a you know a thing that you carry around instead of having to carry around a passport so you can you know gain access to certain places maybe cross borders wherever it may be and we'll end up having something far worse than that where it'll contain a level of your information you know private health information that you probably shouldn't be sharing to private businesses but there is also an argument that private businesses have a right to request whatever they want in order for you to gain access um to their services or their building whatever it may be so it's a real shit show of a situation like i said um especially considering we've got a vaccine that's working pretty well and people are being a lot more 
open and willing to go and get vaccinated which i was very surprised by so to be in a situation we're in at the moment where we're currently having to face this whole id card thing or what would they, what do they call it now it's not it's not a passport it's a certificate right certification or something along those kind of lines some sort of app you have to download on your phone which throws up a whole different array of issues again right you're gonna have to flip in face id your phone to unlock it then you're gonna have to upload and kind of you know input all your private health information and then share that with some you know uh bless her heart some part-time at working in a local pub near your area in order to go and get a good drink still or to go get you know two burgers for a tenner like it's just an absolute shit show absolute shit show but again what can we do what can we do got a jam-packed show for you today as per usual loads of things to dive on in on so make sure you grab yourself a little drinky a little snacky and all that good stuff in between and let's get involved first things first that i kind of stumbled upon today that kind of got me thinking i was like oh you know what things have changed so much these years that i don't even think there's anybody in the scene right now that exists that's of the level of you know somebody like an esco right a uh, very influential i would say um grime mc from uh Sludem crew who unfortunately passed away i'm gonna say in 2017 it might have been um famously known as being jermaine defoe's half brother jermaine defoe being a professional footballer who played for a host of premier league teams here in england um and escobar was one of his kind of you know half brother who's kind of you know very much respected in grime had a lot of uh um you know stories attached to him from the streets that people would probably not be too fond of repeating but you know for lack of a better term he was 30 certified as the kids say out there but definitely one of my favorite mcs he probably didn't have that much of a you know arsenal of lyrics he probably had you know if we're going to count 32 let's say 32s right he probably had maybe 15 32s in his pocket but they were disgusting right whatever 32s he did have they were just you just reeled them off back to back in every set and just completely dappy loads of occasions with him and slew them and god's gift and stuff just absolutely destroying radio sets back in the day pirate radio where i should i should that used to be my religion i'd sit at home recording stuff you know l late into the night on deja on rinse on i forgot the other station too it was like an 87.8 station but radio was really good back in the day not the wanky stuff you have now with nts and all this sort of you know gay internet radio stuff like proper radio where you had to kind of scan across the um the radio waves in order to kind of get a station and you know depending on what location you were you picked up certain pirate radio stations that are located in random abounding random abandoned flats somewhere um really cool ones and you got to hear you know all these amazing up-and-coming mcs from your area you got to have like a little peek into what was going on in terms of the politics this is, also, this is also if you remember was i'm gonna say pre twitter so there was it served as a kind of town square for you to kind of find out what was going on in your area right little street politics um you know developments in buildings and stuff whatever it may be you kind of learned it all through the portal of those pirate radio stations and then sometimes during the day you'd have really good call-in sh radio shows morning shows like drive shows like really really cool um entertainment all around and it was the kind of thing that you didn't want to miss you kind of rushed back to your radio to go and listen to the only thing that i can say was similar to pirate radio back in the day that's kind of existing now is that thing that's going on at the moment what's it called again oh it's this thing it's this thing here yeah the only thing similar i think to pirate radio at the moment is this um what's it it's called a 10 v 10 right and they do like these things where i've got this flyer here for like a rain and Nephews one because i've got a little promotion pack sent to me they've got like a buju and sizzler thing but um the, the, they do really good ones 10 v 10 and then the other example i would say would be over your radio right those are the only two things that are kind of on like an online radio show sometimes even what's what's that very cool is it pink friday what's that one Nicki minaj's thing whatever it is there's not a lot of them that you'd want to rush back home to kind of go and listen to which is why i think you know as great as those pirate they're not great i have not listened to an nts show in my entire life one in full but the kind of the thing that they miss is that kind of appeal where you want to just tune in on time when it's actually on yeah you don't want to watch it like on demand or listen to it back on demand or anything you are kind of you need to tune in on the time that it's actually on air and you don't really get that nowadays isn't it i guess maybe because we're streaming and whatever it may be it sort of replaced that in you know indefinitely but this is definitely an era and nowadays forget just radio streaming just in grime alone i don't think there's a lot of 
I really don't think there's any kids out there at the moment who are even touching someone like an Escobar. And again, like I said, he did, wasn't really that prolific. He didn't have a lot of dubs or a lot of tunes out there. He wasn't really pursuing his musical career that seriously prior to him passing away anyway. Um, and he was still miles ahead of anybody um, that I will see nowadays with the kids coming up. It's pretty, again, maybe it's difficult, it's harsh because that was a golden era. So I'm sort of... Um, comparing the kids that are coming up now to some absolute OG just all like you know comparing the rappers coming up now to like the Jay-Z's and Nas's but that was a really golden era of Graham that you thought people would have maybe built upon right and kind of progressed forward but so far there's not really a lot of kids I would say that are on the level of something like an Escobar so let's play a little bit of what he has to say here in this little clip from Practice Hours 2 Yo, you know what it is, it's practice hours. Right now, it's big bars, repping slew them. Get me, the rest of the camp, you the world, you don't know, it's all Elstone affiliated. Yo, you don't want none, not even a little bit. Every fat man rolls a 16 in a clip, tear at your face, blast with a tint in it. If I see you on roll with your ones, I hope for your sake, do it with no one, because it's death by association anyway. Any break gets in my way, I'll spray. Tech time on a tech night, no purchase. Come on your show, spit, make man nervous. nervous. Tell him to his face, I push something when he's nervous. nervous. I put my ends of cold so hearted murderers. What you never heard of us? I sat on my mouth for conspiracy to murder. Aggravated arm robbery, bus case quick, never again murder. murder. I should take this spit that little bit further. Go and show me the chat shit, I'll turn into a murderer. Man, I'm murderer. A fuck about and I'm murderer. But inside the yard in black ski march, ready to go to task. I swear down, I'm gonna open man's face quick, fast man. I'm murderer. Fuck about and I'm murderer. Run up on your radio show when the clothes are wearing on roll rags. Put couple holes in your torso for no. But there's no one around that sounds like that, really, is it? I really don't think there's anybody around that sounds like that. And again, so R.I.P. Escobar, um, one of our legendary grime MCs from back in the day, somebody who, again, like I said, was played an instrumental part in my growing up. And one of my favorite MCs, along with, you know, Crazy Tish, Dizzy, as per usual, um, Chip, especially during his heyday, Scorcher, ay, 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 so many good stuff, guys, from back in the day. But yeah, definitely somebody that I was a big fan of and I saw, you know, stumble across my timeline the other day. What else we have to move on to? Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. What else do we have here? And then, of course, yeah, this is an article here from The Telegraph about the COVID passports. It says exclusive um, COVID passport trials to begin in the UK at events this month, which is, you know, again, I'm against the passports in general, but you've got to give it to them. This is a pretty clever way to kind of shoehorn it in to normal life, right? By kind of dangling it at the end of a carrot and saying, hey, if you want to go back to these live events, you're going to have to give up some of your own, you know, privacy and whatnot. Uh, it continues here, said COVID passports are set to be trialed at events in Britain within weeks. The Telegraph can reveal as the government pushes ahead with the idea, despite the growing rebellion by MPs, new deals around a dozen pilot schemes for the safety op the safely opening large events will be announced in the coming days with plans to trial COVID certification checks at the FA Cup final, the FA Cup semi final, the League Cup final, the World Snooker Championships are taking part with the Brit Awards also in discussion. Oof, the World Snooker Championships is going to be an absolute terror. But if you've seen any images from there from the crowd, it's absolutely insane. I actually wouldn't mind going. You know, snooker's a bit boring to watch, don't get me wrong. Um, maybe you'd probably want to go to darts instead the, the atmosphere can be a bit more rambunctious but they definitely get on it and they definitely get sloshed when they're out there so that's going to be a good test to see if uh, we've dealt with COVID correctly if people come out there and they're still breathing it continues people or going on these events will be asked to take a COVID test to gain entry and another after attendance so that they are spreading uh, the virus can be monitored government scientists are cl closely involved in designing um, the pilots and will watch everything from the crowd flows to ventilation systems to learn lessons about running events multiple government sources involved in the planning told telegraph it was hoped that the covid passports produced a certificate um, showing your virus status will feature in some pilots the event will run throughout april and may and ministers um want enough conclusions to be drawn from the reopening of large events to be able to happen from mid-June. Again, another stipulation that we weren't, we weren't really aware of prior, right? There's always these conditions to get us back to a level of free. And I don't know if it's just like a consequence of being in politics in the first place and the fact that if you get a little bit of power, it's pretty difficult to let go of it and relinquish it and give back your citizens their freedom. But this idea that we having to kind of jump through these hoops and, you know, pass these tests in order for us to go back to living our normal lives that we were living prior to this crazy virus is just insane. But again, it's one of those things which makes me believe that if they're pushing these kind of crazy you know test things and you know trials that we're having to do then most likely the whole passport things is going to be you know it, it, like i said it's, it's about it's about when if not if it continues
The events in April and May will require negative COVID tests to gain entry. It is hoped that some of the pilots in May can trial an update in the app, which shows whether someone has had a jab or negative tests on antibodies that has been described as a COVID passport. How the passports will work. Um, in other countries, we don't care about that. The announcement will be another indication that the government is pushing ahead with the possibly allowing the people to show COVID status or social uh, um, activity activities even with no final decision taken however a backlash is brewing in the commons with more than 70 mps putting why am i saying these things so wrong putting putting their names to a statement <laughs> opposing the idea they include around 40 tories a figure that will alarm conservative whips given the government's majority in the commons of roughly 80 seats as well as around 20 labor mps and 10 lib dems the statement they backed um, said the following we oppose the, the divisive and discriminatory use of the COVID-19 status certification to deny individuals access to general services businesses or jobs the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald the ex-shadow chancellor have also signed the move comes after Keir Steimer the Labour um, leader told the Telegraph that he thought the British instinct would be against COVID passport once the pandemic eases so Steimer said that there was no easy answer and he would only decide whether to oppose once the detailed proposal had been published what a pussy stand up for something man or, or fall for nothing this guy man god almighty so yeah let's see what happens more so likely than not like i said if you're from the uk just brace yourself this is gonna happen so you don't get too disappointed because you know once these guys start floating these things out there in this sort of manner it, it definitely is an indication that it's gonna go this way regardless whether we like it or not so it is what it is isn't it Next on the docket, we have um, Eric Weinstein on the Joe Rogan podcast, Joe Rogan Experience, having a little bit, um, feeling a little bit aggrieved by the treatment that he's been receiving from Tim Dillon, which is hilarious, right? If you've been familiar, I have posted a clip from Tim Dillon's Patreon, which you should definitely sign up to. It's easily the best $5 I've ever spent on Patreon, easily. Very, very, very worth it. Um, he uploads about two maybe one to two clips bonus shows on his patreon per week as well as the other tiers you get like a rush Charles tier where he sometimes uploads like you know long form video um interviews or feature films that he puts together regardless but you know in general it's tim dylan he's always great value to listen to regardless on what platform he's on and he had like a little you know three minute segment where he kind of ripped to pieces some of the guys involved with the intellectual dark web and basically questioned their credentials in a jokingly and not so jokingly way which is you know valid enough right because especially in the last few months with the resurgence of clubhouse the app uh brett weinstein you know eric weinstein lex friedman uh who else i've seen on there from the idw i'm not sure i've seen um i'm not sure if i've seen sam harris maybe um dave rubin the kind of the guy that's kind of been ousted from that group he was in there but a lot of those guys are spending a lot of time in those you know spaces basically getting i think brett weinstein got basically shouted at by a group of students for being a white guy in some space and he had to kind of apologize and basically got kicked out eventually eric weinstein's obviously you know they're talking about the identity politics and cancer culture stuff that he's usually talking about and it's just interesting because these guys are always kind of as tim did and said viewed as being very smart and very educated people who surround themselves with people who are also very smart and educated and sometimes wealthy and have businesses and whatnot maybe obviously Eric Weinstein is a managing director at Till Capital right Peter Till's little consultation or whatever think tank company that he's part of and again no one really knows what anyone does in this kind of you know LA intellectual grifty sort of thing which is probably advantageous right you kind of want to be as um you kind of want to be as ambiguous as you can be with your occupation what you do so that you can continue doing stuff that you probably have no reason right to do because no one really knows what you do do right is that a thing there is there is sort of like a benefit to that but it's also annoying when you're just constantly talking right i'm, I'm a great person to sort of say that hypocrite here over here um but it's just funny that he got so peeved off by you know tim dylan basically suggesting that he has nothing he doesn't do much because he spends most of his time talking on a free app on clubhouse and bemoaning you know um uh gendered gendered bathrooms and stuff whatever it may be and again it was a joke said in jest but obviously some truth to it and it seemed to have stung really harsh because throughout this entire process or period tim has been constantly saying on his pod oh the wine signs hate me they hate me they hate me and i thought he was just joking around but judging by 
the kind of reaction that Brett had to some of the jokes and he, he made some really horrendous kind of clapback thing that, you know, his wife, Heather Hying, didn't really take too well either. I saw her face when they mentioned Tim's Dylan's name and she didn't seem too amused. It does seem like that intellectual dark web crew, with the exception of maybe Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, they're very incapable of laughing at themselves, which makes it difficult as again, because I'm a fan of these guys. I like, I love the portal, right? Um, I love Brett Weinstein's thing. What's it called? Um, with the Rhino, I forgot what it's called. Dark Horse Podcast, right? I love all those guys, right? Especially during COVID. Um, Brett Weinstein and his wife Heather have been a really good resource in terms of getting an understanding as to how this virus spread in the first place. Obviously, Eric has he's, he's a really good guest on some shows, but especially with Eric, because people have noticed that he started to like you know thinking his shit doesn't stink anymore. So I think that Tim Dillon Barb came at just the right time to sort of simmer him down a bit. And then he went on the Joe Rogan show and basically started crying one more time about the entire thing and brought it up again. So this is definitely proof that Tim is, Tim definitely got to Eric in a way that he probably shouldn't have considering, um, you know, Eric's achievements and what he's done and whatnot. He shouldn't really be bothered or, you know, caring or what, what flipping Tim Dillon has to say. But again, this is the world that we live in, isn't it? <clears throat> I was, you know, you know this question like, what has Eric Weinstein ever done? I did that. I did the marginal revolution. He's engaged there. No, no, no. That question is Tim Dillon joking around. Yeah, I know. He said, "What did he? He never created the Actually, rotato. He was just was very joking. Fun. He was fucking around." That was the funny part about it. He was joking. But he's saying that because he knows you're brilliant. I you love understand? Him the too. only reason why he can say that, if Joe, you were a loser, Joe, Joe, he couldn't say Joe, that. Joe, uh, you don't need to make me feel good about myself. I know, but you brought it up again. <laughs> no, I'm, ta- I'm saying something completely different. Okay. Okay. I actually have been scared of this question. What question? That qu- Tim's question taken seriously. Who's going to take it seriously? Uh, I'm taking it seriously. Okay. <laughs> no, no. You, the- you're- you're in a weird world. Okay, here's here's your weird world. You're in a world of serious intellectual people. But you're, you're damn out straight. With, you're also hanging out with Tim Dillon and me. Uh, and I love it. But it's it's but the problem is like you're you're conflating Joe, these two Joe, things. No, it, Joe, I'm not that angry at Tim Dillon. It's not. I'm not, not that angry. <laughs> you hear that? You heard the word. You heard the word that. That's a problem. Well, you're not that angry at Carlos Mencia. I'm not angry at him at all. Oh, I know. Ooh, I'm, not I'm angry at Tim Dillon. I'm sad. I'm sad for, for Tim him. Dillon. Anyway. Shouldn't be sad for Tim. He's, wait, 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 wait. He's one of the most important comedians of our time. Okay. How dare you? How dare I? Oh, Jesus Christ, man. And again, I don't blame the guy, to be honest. If I'm completely fair to him, I don't blame him. I guess it's, um, it's a natural consequence of being somewhat famous in a field that no one really gives a shit about when it comes to public intellectuals, right? It, sh- it, sh- it should be something that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be commanding views of like upwards of the half a millions for, you know, speaking about stuff that most people can't really comprehend because you happen to have like a, an insanely high IQ, whatever it may be. So it's in this weird world where you really shouldn't be famous for being as intellectually brilliant as you are, but he is. And then you're being famous in your what mid fifties or whatever he, however old he is, it must do something to your brain. It must be a bit strange. And you're hanging around in certain groups and you're going to certain things and you're, you know, you're exposed to, you know different innovations and technologies that are taking place behind the scenes that no one's really aware of it's going to change the future of mankind all this from a lucky it's a lot of stuff to kind of contain in one person's brain and when when somebody sort of calls you out and basically questions your valid you know questions your um position or questions your place in the culture it can get a little bit tense it can make you feel a bit weird overall but it's probably best that again it's like a blessing and a curse it's probably for the best that you you know become more successful and become famous in your 50s as opposed to of course when you're like 18 and stuff and you're still developing as a human but i do maintain that it must be a bit of a mind fuck it really does like he was just a dude that was what lecturing and consulting startups and stuff whatever it may be in silicon valley having somewhat mildly cult iconic some somehow like a cult following maybe in a particular niche in a particular sort of subculture, whatever it may be, and then suddenly you're brought upon, you know, one of the biggest shows in the world, you gain a massive following, you do your own podcast that brings you, uh, that allows you with the income to be a little bit more flexible to do your own thing, and then, you know, your brother's a world, you know, becomes famous too for getting kicked out and sacked from his university and all this malarkey. It must do something to your head, it definitely must, but it's just funny as a Tim Dillon fan to see that those little barbs, those little disses, right, those little jabs that he threw at those guys, just kind of being funny and poking fun, um, has really cut deep with these people who are so brilliant that they shouldn't be really wasting their time with what this pig has to say. But, you know, 
the world that we live in at the moment you sometimes react to the little bit of hate as opposed to the chorus of claps and praises and dick sucks that occur out there in it but hey what can you do next on the list was i the only person that wasn't aware that uh, ebay were dropping paypal as their payment provider this is really strange i'm very very confused and something that i'm actually over the moon about because this means i can go back onto ebay again so it says courtesy of the verge it says psa ebay might not let you sell items without a bank account starting from valentine's day of course this was written earlier on in the year i think in february says the following um in 2002 ebay bought the ebay bought paypal in a 1.5 billion dollar deal turning it into um turning it into the way you would buy and get paid for items you sell on the glamorous um so on a ginormous auction site but the once happy couple has been broken up uh, has been breaking up for years and on valentine's day some sellers may no longer be able to sell items on ebay at all without connecting an old school bank account instead very interesting this morning i received a final e email warning that i would need to add a bank account by february 14th or else your ability to revise um your already list existing listings or create new listings will be disabled um it continues as ebay to so the verge just isn't a deadline or for every seller it's rolling out in phases and a quick scan of web shows is going out for at least a couple of years um it's been going on for at least a couple of years this isn't the final phase either as ebay tells us the rollout won't be complete until 2022 so you still got some time but i suspect it's moving fast i got this message despite rarely selling items on ebay and company tells me that the majority of sellers will be have ebay managed payments by the end of this year digging up a bank account and plugging it into your profile may not be the only annoyance here by the way you'll be waiting a lot longer off your money as ebay managed payment sites payment sites points out so this is what basically they laid out here they said what to expect you complete your sales as step one um, once the buyer has paid the funds are show as pending and the seller hub it's time for you to ship the order once the bank settles the transaction on ebay funds show as available step two payout initiate step two the payout is initiated daily or weekly based on your scheduled um selected payment schedule normal processing times between one to four business days depending on the bank and then pay out free your bank sells the funds in your account within a normal processing time so it looks like from you selling the item to you getting the money in your account it could be anywhere between two to seven working days which obviously is pretty decent i still think and i think for the most part for people like myself who i kind of stopped selling on ebay purpose well specifically because of paypal um i ran into a few issues when i was selling a couple of cameras and trainers when people kind of declared that they didn't receive their items and then you go through the entire stupid you know um conflict resolutions thing i forgot what it's called was it whatever it's called on on, on paypal and then because even paper were linked if you then got banned and you weren't able to use your paper anymore you, you automatically your ebay got banned too because it, it looked like you didn't complete the sale the person would leave you bad feedback just a complete shish of a situation so if they're able to somehow in um bring it all in house i'm definitely going to be um happy with it it's just interesting that they would pay 1.5 billion for an app like paypal and then suddenly remove the um is this what it says right ebay actually purchased it right ebay bought uh ebay bought paypal for 1.5 billion so what are they gonna do? so i guess is this something that's been hidden behind the scenes as in like paypal is gonna turn into like a b2b thing or is this just an ebay thing i'm assuming it's just an ebay thing right the integration is going and then paypal as a business itself is still going to be around but i thought that was a very interesting development and again um it's definitely going to take out not take it's definitely going to remove the need for people to go and buy like um aged accounts because that's something i was considering to do because there's a few sites out there that offer people the opportunity if you're banned from selling on ebay you can or selling on selling on ebay because you don't have a paypal you can buy a paypal account that's been aged and then change the details i guess or whatever it may be or maybe set up a virtual debit card or something i don't know what they do but there is things that you can do so that completely takes out that business but again maybe it then sort of longs out the process in terms of but then this might also explain why you i'm seeing all these weird op-eds on happiest for ebay all right these little weird op-eds where they're like oh the 10 items that you should buy blah blah blah, blah. this makes a lot of sense that they're sort of bringing everything in the house it says here continues <clears throat> three to six business days is a long time to risk first you can wait for money that could be instantly popped into your paypal that said as my last ebay sell didn't immediately release five funds and either so shrug emojis no i don't think that's true i think even apps like depop you still have to wait about a week to get your money in hand from time for the person receiving all that malarkey and the, the, the funds are clear because there's still i guess it depends on the status of your actual paypal account if your paypal account's been verified and you've got all the limits cleared then maybe when someone sends you the money it kind of shows up straight away but for the most part there's always a bit of a hold on it 
just to ensure that the person receives the P. And if this and if PayPal's integrated with a site's integrated with and a person marks as received, then obviously it gets released and bloody blah blah. So it's never been instant really. The only instant thing I could see happening in the future is if some companies integrated stuff like, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain and all that and escrow source ways of peer-to-peer -peer ways of basically paying and selling for things that would be the only way it'd be instant but as is it's not going to happen it continues on the plus side ebay says this most sellers should quickly pay should actually quickly why well, i keep reading so crap um ebay says most sellers should actually pay lower fees than before and provide a variety of case studies at this page but it's not um like ebay is really passing along the savings previously ebay would typically take 10 percent cut and paypal will take a 2.9 percent cut in total of 12 0.9 percent of your take now ebay is taking uh, a 12.5 three percent cut in the same situation which makes sense again they're gonna make a cheeky bit of money on top of it while ebay's graphic above might look like you're saving a big chunk of money when asked a middleman you can see if you look carefully the size of the bars are misleading and the mid the new middleman is ebay but I'm, again i'm i'm fine with it as somebody that's not been able to sell on ebay for years because my paper has been fucked up i'm more than happy to have this um ability to do what I know how to do best, and that is to sell overpriced trainers to teenagers around the world. Next on the list, what else do we have here? Ba, 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 ba. What else do we have? Let's go here. Let's move this to see how much time we've used up already. Bear with me. Bish bash boss. You got this, you got that, you got this, you got that, you got this. What else you have here? You got that, you got this. Yeah, let's go for this one. So this is a this is obviously something that's been developing for a few days now. Um the very influential and famous, well known um, makeup artist on YouTube, James Charles is admits to messaging underage boys, sixteen year old boys is basically admitted to it in his now famous uh second round of apology video where he's got this sort of quasi bird nest haircut planted on top of his head it says the following um beauty youtuber james charles has admitted to sending ex sexually explicit messages to two 16 year old boys he says in the video i fully understand my actions and how they are wrong he said the 21 year old said which we forget in it he's 21 years old actually and it's all this stuff about being a child and being a kid and not knowing good from you know not knowing right from wrong especially when you consider that the amount of time he's been in the public eye and doing stuff within social media space he's you know he knows the rules he knows what, what what you should and shouldn't be doing on these platforms but hey it continues um allegations against charles first emerged on social media earlier this year in february the influencer who has 25 million subscribers on his youtube channel was accused by one teenager of grooming which charles denied saying he flirted with the person because he believed the boy was under eight to be 18 <laughs> charles denied the previous allegations but in a thursday video titled holding myself accountable he admitted the wrongdoing he says that there were two instances one last year and one more recently but i think it's actually 17 if you go on that deaf noodles um twitter account who's like a um what is he he's sort of like a youtube influencer narc in it right he's the one that sort of like tell he's like the hall monitor the hall monitor kind of it's mostly to do with wrongdoing it's not that bad but it still seems a bit strange that there's this guy that's spending his entire life cataloging all the misgivings and wrongdoings of these um of these kind of very well protected um youtube influencers who kind of are incapable of doing anything wrong even when it's something to do with you know breaking the actual law uh, and there's this adult that's all spending his time chronicling all these misgivings and i guess making himself the enemy of most of these youtube influencers and also an enemy of the fans because i would imagine a large portion of james charles fans probably don't want to hear this right they just want to watch the makeup videos um follow him on snap and tiktok continue dancing with him and bang his flipping palace they don't really care about all this stuff which is the, f the actually the most concerning part of it is that the only people that are actually pushing to get this guy quote-unquote cancelled are people that aren't fans of him his actual fans don't care they really don't care they, if he puts out content tomorrow and he just continues collaborating with people as per normal which he probably won't because you know most of these guys don't have any backbone and if he gets accused of what he's accused of they just you know avoid him until the the heat kind of dies off and then they'll all refollow him again as they always do um that's what happened the first time around if i remember correctly right everyone kind of unfollowed him on social and as soon as he kind of came out with that video with receipts sort of debunking the claims everyone sort of refollowed him again so it's just a funny situation in general to look at it continues it said these conversations should never happened charles said in the 14 minute video he admitted that he could um have searched for them on social media platforms and found their real ages <laughs> the funny thing also about this is that imagine if this was women if this was girls instead of guys right like 
this situation would be far more egregious. But the fact that it's dudes, it kind of then proves again the double standards. Like no one really cares about the safety of young guys on, you know, on these social media sites, the young teenage boys actually, right? Children. No one really cares about their safety and what they're being exposed to. But if it's t if this if these were teenage girls. Like the people would be going absolutely ape shit, uh, but as it uh, but as it is, I guess people just you know are gonna just keep it moving. He continues to public apologize to the boys and said that he would take time away from posting on social media to educate himself about these issues. <laughs> What's it educate yourself about, mate? You're 21. Just don't try and fondle 16 year olds in it that's pretty easy mate he continues i'm desperate the scandal is not the first time the beauty influencer has faced controversy in 2019 he was accused of using fame and money to try and manipulate someone's sexuality which which you would imagine a lot of people would do when they get fame and money right part of the part of the appeal and part of the draw and part of the reasoning to go out there and achieve things to stay in fairly good shape and to groom yourself well and wear expensive clothes and put on really you know fabulous fragrances would be to <laughs> ex manipulate people's for their sexuality right that's exactly what some people do out there especially in hollywood i would assume so so he's only just following tradition right it, it, it's a bit it's a bit crude it's a bit you know horrendous and it probably leaves a bit of a sick taste in the back of your throat but it really is what it is like you know there is a story the long history of people manipulating young impressionable um people that come into the industry with their fame and their money it just is what it is and some people are willing to you know to take part in that you know somewhat faustian bargain it continues um da -da -da -da. when addressing why he has been reckless in past relationships he said that it's because that like, he's desperate imagine getting on social media having to apologize because you want to keep all your brand deals and then having to admit to anybody that you're, you're the reason why you're messaging 16 year olds is because you're just too horny right you're just too too horny and this is this is also somebody that looks like from what i see so far this looks like somebody that doesn't drink too much and doesn't use that many drugs and he's already this thirsty imagine when he finally discovers the beauty of drowning your sorrows and you know comforting yourself psychologically through a bottle of you know brown liquor and through some class a substances imagine how what how bad he will be at that point he's bad enough as he is sober somewhat right indulging in what donuts and stuff and what's that steak restaurant they all go to um i don't know whatever one of these places right yeah charlie's quintin it's always called someone's name these kind of clandestine little bistro restaurant places that they all go to he can't take pictures um and he imagine he's, he's horny like this and he doesn't even do meth he's not on coke all the time he's not drinking flipping 1942 every night it looks like i you know, don't really follow the guy too much and he's already this horny imagine once he suddenly then discovers you know the life of uh the debaucherous few and gets involved in that he's gonna be he's gonna be a monster like if he's not one already it continues um in the video he made it just in 2019 he said um Charles made a promise that he'll be more careful moving forward. The promise is that why he's got these like um lock and key little earrings in, right? This is my promise to you, my friends. I love it. And the YouTubers are always so funny, man. These influencer types, isn't it? The white background, the non makeup, the hair, like he just come out of bed. I'm taking this seriously. And it's again, it's. It, it's disingenuous because you know most often more often than not they're only doing this number one to maybe get in front of a media story rewrite the narrative um maybe just to make sure that they don't lose all their brand deals but it's never come it's never really for a uh it's never really come from a point of um uh moral or ethical reawakening it doesn't really come from that right it's not that they just they thought oh no man what i did was actually fucked up i need to atone for my wrongs and tell my friends that i'm a changed person you know because you don't really tell people that you've changed you your, your actions should prove it um but they I, I do like how how sort of um disingenuous it is from the outset like they don't try and pretend that they're doing this because they are actually sorry they're only doing this because they got caught and they don't want to keep losing money effectively right they got brand deals that are effectively paying for their hidden hills mansion somewhere wherever they're living and allowing them to go on trips to turks and caicos they don't want that to go away so the only way to prevent it not to go away is to get in front of the camera and basically bear all quote unquote it continues but as time progressed he says in his most recent video he began and ignoring red flags again <laughs> a red flag would probably be when you're and again i don't use tiktok too often right but whenever you do do go on tiktok especially on the feed when you first open the app they curate it in a way so that you do get to see and consume the content that they want you to see which 
generally you know kind of skews on the young side of things right so you see loads of young guys and boys dancing and doing little comedy skits or whatever it may be and if you spend enough time on there and you like enough of the right things quote unquote you end up in this weird rabbit hole where everybody that you will be crossing across coming across your feed will look like they're at most 19 at most right some of them of course might look a little bit younger than what they actually are if you're you know you're, if you're clever with the makeup tricks and you make sure you don't have any facial hair you can fool most people but you can tell when somebody's young it's just easy to basically see especially when they're shamelessly flaying around doing some really horrendous dance quote unquote in the middle of nowhere right it just you, you know that only a child would think that would be cool to go and prop a camera up outside of a you know walmart car park somewhere and do the fucking renegade right only a teenager would think that's a cool idea to do so to sit there and say you were ignoring red flags there's red flags all over the app right especially if you're old enough you feel gross watching or flicking and going through some of the videos because they're all these like again young teenage guys and boys in very tight clothes jumping around in front of a camera dancing seductively and you know unless you're of the same age range it should make you feel a bit weird <laughs> so i don't know what sort of education of red flags he sort of is talking about but hey it continues he ended the video by vowing to be more cautious in the future and stop treating social media accounts as dating apps and i don't really understand again maybe it's the app itself but is I would assume there's quite a few young looking uh, I, I guess i'll assume the kind of guy that jeremy charles is into he could find them that person on tinder he could find that person on the grinder or something right i'm sure there isn't there there's an app for social media influencers called um raya right i'm sure you could find somebody on there like why doesn't he use those kind of things why is it why is it um why is he always getting caught out on the social media apps because it doesn't seem like he's creeping on people on the dating apps it seems like it's mostly coming through the all access social media app things which makes sense i guess and it may be the untapped potential or most of the qes quote unquote which is disgusting to say exist on these social media apps because they are not old enough to be on the dating apps <laughs> that would be one of the red flags which is flipping hilarious if you think about it right that he's saying oh um i need to be more careful and do more research but he's only doing the research on the social media apps because he's more he knows he's likely to come across people who are underage allegedly i'd assume who knows it continues accusations and admissions of sexual misconduct by youtubers have become more and more common in 2019 youtuber justin jones channel after admitting it's james da, 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 david dobrik and of course bloody blah 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 but yeah what's going to happen to the guy going forward probably nothing again um as we've seen in days gone by and in years gone by with other big youtube creators and influencers for the most part if their fan base is big enough and they kind of give less of a shit about what the general public think about them they should be okay um maybe that's where um james charles will end up kind of faltering it does look like he actually cares about the opinion of the general public as opposed to someone like a jeffree star who seems to basically not really give a shit about what anyone says no amount of op-eds or revelations or exposure pieces are ever gonna make him sort of change what he's doing he's just gonna keep continuing doing it because his fans kind of continue to continue backing what he makes and you know it is what it is and like i said previously i'm not really a fan of you know the industry wide or yeah industry yeah industry whatever wide um cancel culture thing that people do i'd still be a fan of mostly your your actual fan base deciding whether or not you should have a career or not that should how that should that should be how you basically um succeed or die right um your fans build you up and if they decide that you've kind of you know overstayed your welcome or the things that you're doing are beyond reproach then they can then decide to cancel you by stop watching your stuff and kind of you know or i'm subscribing that's fair enough but these kind of big corporations coming in and sort of basically putting you in a corner where you can't feed your family because they feel like they've been shamed into doing so not because they actually feel morally affected or ethically affected by what you've done is not really for me so if james charles wants any advice you should probably look at jeffree star in terms of who to follow if he doesn't care and if he does care maybe take the david Dobrik approach and just go silent for a bit um you know use the silence as a time to educate yourself and learn and uh recalibrate what you want to do in the world and all that malarkey that could be a way to do things that way um there's quite a few options there but it's just hilarious that no one really cares in general because it's boys right if this was girls this situation would be far worse because you know a 21 year old boy mentioned you know continuously mentioning continually men messaging i can't my words get messed up there 
16 year olds is f- weird in it but it's also kind of strange too that nothing actually happened from why i'm if i'm if i'm um being correct here right it's just messages right it's just kind of um sexting and stuff whatever but nothing actually happened in real life which is an odd one i guess it depends on the state you're in i'm assuming some states have some real some very strict laws about messaging people underage and also about sexting blah 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 but if nothing actually happened in real life should your career be thrown out of the window for that completely i don't know but then again you know it is a bit strange that a 16 uh, a 21 year old constantly wants to be around kids of that age like i know what it was to be 21 i know what it was to be 16 and 18 and you know I, I didn't really have a lot of friends in my friendship group who were boys who were 16 or 18 when I was 21 because they were insufferable, right? You just didn't want to hang around the kids that young. It's just too much. So I can't imagine what it must be like to be in a romantic relationship with somebody that young, especially when you're someone like a James Charles and you've, you know, so accomplished, so much money, so much fame. Like, what are you actually getting from that relationship? I don't know. But um, hey, this is way above my pay grade and i hope it gets sorted for everybody involved i'm still a bit you know i i'm not really a bit i'm not that comfortable with seeing accounts like death noodles essentially just destroying people's careers overnight and kind of take you know getting all these old clips and putting them together and make you look like a monster but maybe in some cases when it's like this you might have to intervene right um and kind of put an end to these sort of things just in case it gets too serious because as much as i said you know it was only text messages you don't want this to go unchecked so that it continues on and then it ends up being something that ends up negatively affecting someone's life forever and you know no one would forgive themselves if that kind of happened so that might make complete sense in that regard move on we 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 move on um it looks like according to ra it looks like one of my favorite djs mercy john ensemble has quietly changed his name um without really alerting anybody which is uh very wise of him i would say if you remember what was it is it kind of was it in the summer it might have been summer no it was it summer or beginning of the winter but there was a lot of conversations around you know some electronic djs and their names being you know a little bit misleading in terms of their racial representation let's say or as if yep yeah. I think one of the main examples was the Black Madonna who ended up changing her name to the Blessed Madonna and there's a conversation around a few other people and then um, obviously Mosley and John Ensemble was basically getting put into a corner as well with his name which kind of stems from Detroit techno scene I'm pretty sure right Motor City I'm pretty sure it's from Detroit um, that's where his sort of name is basically taken from it's basically an ode to that um, and then obviously over the course of that entire summer it felt like people were just getting pelted in it and um, he didn't really reply it felt like I don't think he said anything when it came to his name he kind of kind of kept his a low profile but it seems like all of the flyers that are coming out now for the parties kind of you know from this summer onwards have featured his name and it's like and according to his RA article it says here Daniel Danilo Pleslo that's his actual name aka MCDE which is what he used to, was going by for a while as well he changed it from mostly drum ensemble to MCDE too um, so that was kind of a kind of a pivot into maybe calling himself Dan- Danilo Pleslo going forward it says he mixes the fabrics um, presentation club compilation a continuous mix and double vinyl sampler are out in tw- to May 28th and again he's got his name uh, fabric presents Daniel Pleslo MCDE oh see that's what it's actually going to be called so he's definitely changed it going forward so that's been interesting isn't it the changing of your name um and as you continue to mix the 28 tracks or 11 of which are included on a double vinyl sampler the mix will be available on cd and digitally from may 28th um with the vinyl available at same date the f- interesting thing about it if i remember correctly uh, one of the guys basically said at the time that he was coming up you couldn't get away. I think it was in America. At the time he was coming up, you couldn't get away with having a white name playing Chicago House. So you kind of had to change your name to be racially ambiguous so that you could get booked or so that it looked good on a flyer. Who knows what it was? So it's just funny that nowadays, fast forward, you know, a couple of decades, and now, unless you have like a very European German sounding name, you can't appear on certain flyers or unless your name has a certain, you know, weight to it or it was kind of a, kind of a, um, it's kind of assigned or what's that word called not signed it's kind of associated with a very well-known label or a collective then you also you won't go and get on certain sort of flyers so the issues from the or from yesteryears are kind of repeating themselves right going forward and um, again going f- this is i don't see how this sort of like serves anybody going forward in terms of race representation in terms of you know there being a little bit more um 
I don't know. We'll say democ- democracy. But in terms of things being mixed up on lineups, I don't see how this is going to be a real game changer in this regard. But, you know, it's just, I guess it's a good move from Daniel Pleslow. It does just show that he kind of recognises the plight of racial minorities within the electronic and dance music scene. And he's making amends and doing his best and all this sort of malarkey. So, yeah, interesting. He's quietly done it. Not really mentioned it anywhere else, I don't think. Again, I've not really checked his Facebook page or anything because a lot of those guys usually provide updates on there. But from what we see so far, MCDE has permanently or is slowly but surely changing his name to Daniel Pleslo. So going forward and his sampler for Fabric is going to be out on May 28th. So definitely check that and support that if you're that way inclined. What else we have here? We have another name change, a place called Gear Sluts, the Gear Space. Uh, the name change follows original website's builder Meg Lee Chin's reports of misconduct by a co-founder. The audio engineering forum called Gear Sluts, which is a pretty decent name, isn't it? That's a really good name. It's like head, is that is that head file or is it hi fi? That audio file um, forum that I used to use back in the day. That's a pretty decent name, but Gear Sluts is pretty sick. It kind of reminds me of, um, what's that Joe Rogan? t-shirt thing you wanted to do back in the day turbo sluts right so sort of similar to that it continues the idea behind the name change is to make the forum more inclusive and better suited to the present uh, professional environment and uh, audio education world the move follows an online petition that gained f- over 5,000 signatures requesting the name change the original site which dubs itself as the world's biggest pro audio forum was built by Meg Lee Chen in 20- 2000 and co-founded by Julian Stadman in 2010 Lee Chen reached an old out court settlement with Stedman over claims that he He'd engaged in he'd renegade re, reneged on a deal stipulating Lee Chen as a partner. I built and created Gear Slots with Julian Stedman, she wrote in January after the petition to rename the site was launched. He was a head moderator, performed on all the technical work besides the scene behind the scenes. He chose the awful name after seven years of busting my ear as a week Stedman decided to pretend I was not a partner but just an employee. Oof, that's strong, isn't it? Uh, you can read her experience here on the vlog. So what did he? What what did he? So was it just misconduct in terms of him being? This is what I mean as well. Sometimes, can you take people to court for being a bad partner and being a bit of a dickhead? Like you know, he didn't do anything malicious to her, right? He just was a bit of a shitty partner, and he's been taken to court. Um, the name's been changed to Gear Space, and he's been what kicked out of his own forum. It looks like, by the sounds of it. I guess isn't it. I guess if it works for them, maybe Gear Space as a name works better. But I quite like the name Gear Slots. I think it's got a bit of punch to it. But maybe in the, the era we're living in now at the moment, it probably isn't the wisest thing to call your forum in it. And then what else do we have here? What time are we at? Because I need to end now and jet off before. Yeah, we got this. Um, so this is a, this is yeah, this is a pretty decent article. So this is from Resident Advisor. It's the following. It's called "What Happened to Tech House." It's a pretty cool ten-minute um, story on the kind of origins of Tech House. You know where it kind of went wrong and what the future sort of holds for that entire scene. And it's interesting and funny because it comes from RA, who I would consume, or who I would assume would be one of the main culprits as to why people have such a big issue with Tech House and the scene in general. Right, the kind of snobby, I would say, mostly Berlin-centric point of view that they come from um, would mean that they would automatically not be a fan of the guys and girls that play in that scene because effectively they're in completely two different scenes right in general right especially when you, when you think about the clubs that they play at and the kind of people that go to different parties right you just compare people that go to like Grease Mueller to somebody that would go to like a you know DC 10 they're probably not the same person whatsoever there's probably no overlap involved in there apart from they have them probably having the same color clothes in their wardrobe right loads of black maybe to some extent although some of those tech house people are kind of transitioning into wearing a lot of color and whatnot and it's a pretty decent um again a video a piece about the entire thing um it's a bit it's a little bit you know thin on the ground of course it's only 10 minutes so they can only get across so much information i do think they missed out an entire piece in terms of focusing around the kind of 93 feet east scene and all these sort of guys and girls especially in the uk all around the uk i think of that girl called alicia who i kind of followed for a bit on twitter and stuff and that entire scene of people who and michael bb's and all those kind of people who have kind of taken the tech house scene to a whole different level and part of me thinks a lot of the issues around it are b- mostly based on snobbery right mostly based on people feeling like they're better than them and feeling like they don't really represent dance music adequately i think people view tech house 
community fans as similar to they would view people from the edm scene they kind of look down upon them and i don't really see the reason for it i think it can all coexist i don't think there is one particular way to enjoy or to consume or to make or to play dance music or electronic music in any way shape or form um the fact that these sort of scenes have kind of remained somewhat relevant throughout many many decades of changes in terms of the music industry and scenes and tastes and whatnot is testament as well to the great work that people are doing there they really kind of um again for the most part from what i've seen for the tech house community guys they really consume a lot of the content that revolves around this scene they go out to parties they buy tunes they're buying pieces of merch they're following people around in places when they're going on tour they're actually taking part in the scene you know in a very active way some what some would say maybe a more active way than some of the chin strokers online who only have things to say in comments or whatnot these guys are actually going out there and sort of like you know quote like for lack of a better term they're on the front lines right they're on the party front lines all ketted up um ready to party and I, you can't really blame the dudes in there for doing what they're doing and there is a funny interesting piece on there about like the origins and the originators of it kind of being press shy and then fast forward to nowadays um you know most of these guys are like you know selling courses on how to utilize social media in order to kind of boost your djing profile and all that malarkey and sell more tickets so it's a complete kind of evolution uh, and a completely different type of person that's kind of consuming that music again the i would say for the only critique about it i would say overall would be the songs are a bit formulaic the people playing are very formulaic even that leash yo she's got that whole like arms out wide thing that kind of really cringy sort of like gun finger pose stuff it's really big you know it's a bit too much for me loads of roll loads of kind of rolling effects on the mix and all that kind of stuff there is a particular way that they play that everyone's kind of got the same sort of style no one really sticks out too much the only kind of interesting era i can think of that whole tech house scene has to be when it was a bit more minimally and a little bit more dubby when you know um what they call jamie jones and seth chocolate guys were around right and they were doing their thing in that kind of vibe that was the only time i kind of enjoyed it but nowadays it does feel a little bit formulaic it is a bit samey same you can kind of you know close your eyes and you know basically identify where the drop's gonna come without um any really much work so that makes it a bit difficult but overall i i think they should be allowed to coexist um they are an integral part of the scene they i would argue that most clubs will probably say they are the ones that basically pay the rent for a lot of their um you know a lot of their venues around the world and you know pro provide the salary stable salary for a lot of people they employ a whole host of people too um maybe some of the djs themselves are you know maybe not the most um uh, refined characters um they might not be the most uh enjoyable characters to hang around with on a day-to-day -day basis but I'm, I'm a fan of it i like it man i like to dip in and out of that scene and see stuff from afar um but again i recommend you check it out it's called what happened to tech house it's available on resident advisor a pretty decent um video i'll play a little bit of actually so you can see what i mean about it but this is the clip tech house might be dance music's most divisive subject the style is globally popular and indisputably big but for years, it's been dismissed as being functional, too commercial and formulaic. Those criticisms, however, usually fail to grasp the music's complicated history. The style is frequently misunderstood as being something like this. But for those who know about its origins, Tech House is actually something like this. So how did this confusion arise? If techno comes from Detroit and house comes from Chicago, where did tech house come from? And how did a sound that once epitomized the underground end up being so widely disrespected? So yeah, so check it out if you're that way inclined. Pretty decent article um, or video piece, my mirror. Anyway. That is your external English show, number 447. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's the first time tuning into the show, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.